verse I read was 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And if we could, I'd like to go back with that uh, just to start off. And the Bible says, and the verse says this, Therefore, if any man or anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So one of the principles that we understand as Christians today is that we live, we walk in the transformed life. Uh, a person has said, what this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore. The old life has gone and new life has begun. That's the way the New Living Translation has put it. This is the Christian message that our hopeless, broken lives can be healed and they can be changed. In Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, this is a really good verse to memorise if you're, if you're that way inclined. And I do encourage you to memorise Bible verses. It says these words, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is... Uh, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Uh, Lord, we're just so conscious of the fact that in our own strength, in our own abilities, we're not even worthy to say the name of Jesus. But Lord, because of your sacrifice and your love and your mercy, uh, Lord, today we're more than conquerors in Jesus' name. And Father, it's all about how we can better serve you and worship you and praise you and live a life that is dynamic and full of victory, Father. Lord, I pray for those, Lord, that are in need of your special touch, for those that are going through difficult times. God, we thank you, Lord, that your word has promises. And Lord, that you say, Lord, that a bruised reed he will not break. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and you care for us. You sustain us, oh Lord. Help us to look to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what does it mean, therefore, by the mercies of God? Whenever you see the word therefore in your Bible, you should say, what is it therefore? You know, why does God put this scripture in scripture? We know that in Romans 5.8 it says, but God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were still bad, we didn't have to become good to get God's love. While we were still sinners, while we were still bad, God loves us. Why we were still bad. So we've got to get the religion out of us. We've got to get the religious teaching, the mindset out of us. That oh, I'm good, oh, God's going to bless me. I'm bad, that you know, God's not going to love me. God will love you regardless. And so we need to understand that God's love for us is unconditional. It is a love like a, a parent loves a child that they just love. But, you know, the Bible says you are evil, yet you know how to do good. If your son or your daughter comes and asks for a piece of bread, do you give him a stone? No. If they ask for a piece of fish, do you give them a scorpion? No. And the, Jesus says if you're evil... If you're evil and you know how to do something good like that, how much more my Father in heaven knows how to bless you. You see, God wants to bless you, but he doesn't want to bless you the, the way that this world conforms our thinking to bless you. Because the conforming in this world is that you live a life of total peace without any enemies or any fights. The Bible says that to be successful and to live a life that is good, you need to have money running out of every single place so that every jar in the kitchen's got money. Your account is full and overflowing. That's what peace is to, to the world. What peace is to the world is that you're still status is good. You live in the right jolly postcode and everybody looks at you and we don't say it, but you walk in and everyone bows down to you. Oh, there comes Pastor Robert. Man, he's got his act together. He's good. He's this, he's that. Or you walk in the room and everyone's going to look. Oh, they've achieved so much or they've done so much. And you know, in God's eyes, that's all completely, totally not worth anything. It's rubbish in God's eyes because it's this world Churches do it. Where churches have to have the latest carpet and the chairs. And, I mean, I'm in all for it, but it means nothing if you don't have Christ. So you've got to get this life of balance into your head because if it doesn't, you will lose out. 
If it doesn't, you'll be messed up between your ears. And when you're messed up, the problem is it doesn't stay with you. You're messed up. People around you get messed up because they love you and they're going, what's going on, you know? And so we need to be uh, trailblazers. We need to be having this stuff completely under control because when we got it under control, then it's good. You live a life of victory because God is great, because God is good. But the battle is here. I'll read it to you again. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice which is acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and don't be conformed to this world. So Jesus invites us to experience a new and transformed life. So what do we need to do? Three little things that I'm going to really go through quite fast because I want you guys you know, to really read this in your own time and look, get it on the CD or whatever, on the internet if it's playing, just go over it. Firstly, I want to encourage you, it says, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Paul says it's your reasonable service, your spiritual act of worship. Worship isn't just about the songs that we sing and lifting up our hands. True worship is a lifestyle. In Mark 8.34, Jesus said these words, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus died for you, just like that little DVD presentation we had. He died for you. So who will, will you live for him? He died for you, but will you dare to live for him? He died for you, but will you dare to live for him? He died for you. He died for you and you and you and you and me, the whole world. But will you dare to live for him or will you completely turn your back on that and live for you? If you're feeling a little bit unsettled this morning, I hope you do. Because that's my job, to push us, to encourage us out of our comfort zone where everything's okay. I'd, you know, C.S. Lewis said these great, he said, Jesus was either a lord, he's either a liar, or he's a lunatic. Which one is he to you? Is he a liar? Is his word lying? He speaks about peace in your heart, but it's all lies. It's, it's, it's lies from the devil. Or Jesus isn't even true, it's just lies. It's some religious people over thousands of years that all think the same and they're all stupid and they're all liars. God is a liar. Was Jesus a lunatic? I'm waiting for the lightning bolt. To... Was he a lunatic? Was he crazy man? Is it crazy for you to live your life as a Christian? To come to church on Sunday morning a few times a week? To financially do this? To share with others about God, the gospel? This sort of stuff? Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic? Or is he maybe just the Lord of the universe? Or is he maybe just the master of the universe? Or is he the person that we surrender to? You know, it's not about being perfect because none of us is perfect. It's about us being understanding in his ways. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. me. And the life that, now live in, that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Not by my good deeds, in the son, by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. So I've been crucified. That Paul was able to say that. And we need to be able to have that mindset and that mentality. Someone once said the problem with the living sacrifice is that they always want to crawl off the altar. I know I do that. When the heat's on, man, I'm out of here. You know, there's certain areas of my life that, man, it's all good, but like, because we're living, we crawl. The thing about a dead altar is like, it ain't going anywhere. All right, so we need to die to ourselves. That means to die from the influences around us. Second one is that we need to get into our heads that we're not conformed to this world anymore. And that's a decision that you make. I can pray for you a thousand times. I can have a thousand altar calls. I can do whatever. It means diddly squat. Zero, zilch, niente, nothing, nine, zilch, whatever it is that you say. Because it's more than just an emotional response. It needs to come from here. 
you need to decide. There's decisions that we make to do. So what does it mean to be conformed to the world? In the New Living Translation, it actually says, don't copy the behaviour and customs of the world. In Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21, in the New Living Translation, it says this, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your lives will produce these evil results. Right Now, I'm an up person. I like to speak on the up things. But these are some of the things that you've got to have a balance in it. All right, so these, are, these uh, will produce these evil results. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities. You know, they're all bad. All right, they're bad. But then it says hostility. Uh, hostile. Are you hostile with people around you? They, a bit of a prickly pear. Someone comes to you, bah. You know, we need to be gracious in our responses to people. Loving and merciful. Jealousy. Outbursts of anger. Selfish ambition. That goes against the corporate world, let me tell you. Goes against most of the world. Selfish ambition, it's all about me. It's not about, so long as I'm ahead, who cares? You know, Christians even justify it. The better I am, then the better I can help others. So it's okay for me to walk all over you. Because then I'll be okay. As long as I'm okay, then I'll be able to be in control. Selfish ambition. Divisions. The feeling that everyone is wrong except for those in your own little group. Envy. Drunkenness. Wild party, parties. Not like next Friday night, let me tell you. Right? Wild parties and the other kinds of sin. <laughs> Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we need to understand that and, and embrace that. And it's not a negative. It means that we've got to live in a, a life that is consistent with the word of God. Will God still love us? The answer is yes. But not everyone goes to heaven. You need to walk in him. Does he still love you? Yeah. But you need to understand that balance. God doesn't want us to live in a way, in that way any longer. He wants us to change. I'll give you a few little illustrations here. A few years ago, psychologist Ruth W. Berenda and her associates carried out an interesting experiment with teenagers designed to show how a person handled group pressure. Because most of us here are under group pressure. Who knows what that is? Everybody does it, so we've got to do it. Everybody does it, so you've got to do it. You might go to the pub, everyone's having shots, you've got to have shots. That's what I'm talking about. Everyone does this, so you've got to do it. Uh, at the party, everyone does a collection, so you've got to do in the collection. At the party, everyone does, so there's group pressure. All right? It takes a strong person to stand up to group pressure for your convictions. Takes a man, takes a woman of God to understand when to say yes and when to say no. Right? But you young people especially, you need to stand up against a group pressure because the pressure is there today. The older ones as well, I'm not sort of saying no, but we need to understand. So the plan was simple. They brought in groups of 10 adolescents into a room for a test. Subsequently, each group of 10 was instructed to raise their hands when the teacher pointed to the longest line on three separate charts. What one person in the group did not know was that the, other, that the nine of the others in the room had been instructed ahead of time to vote for the second longest line, not the longest line. Regardless of the instructions they heard, once they were all together in the room, the nine were not to vote for the longest line, but rather vote for the next longest line. Can we have the volume down just a bit, guys? It's a bit of reverb, Phil. Uh, for the next longest line. The experiment began with nine teenagers voting for the wrong line. The stooge would typically glance around and they would frown in confusion and slip his hand up with the rest of the group. Why? Because every, even though they knew that the longest line was there, everybody else did it. What's wrong with me? So everybody else put their hand up, so they put their hand up. Everybody else voted like that. They voted their hand up like that. 
The instructions were repeated and the next card was raised. Time after time, the self-conscious stooge would sit there saying a short line that is longer than a long line simply because he lacked the courage to challenge the group. The remarkable conformity occurred in about 75% of all cases and was true of small children and high school students as well. Berenda, the psychologist, concluded that some people had rather be uh, had rather be president than right, which is certainly an accurate assessment. So rather than tell the truth, they would just conform. Here's another one. Uh, M. Griffin, in his book The Mind Changes, described an experiment done by Solomon Ashk with a group of 12 people. They were brought into a room where four lines of unequal length were displayed. They had decided which two were the same length and publicly vote for their choice. Person after person, 11 in all, voted for the wrong line because they'd all been told ahead of time. The one individual who was in the dark and couldn't imagine how, the world, how in the world all these seemingly normal people could all choose the wrong line was there. When it was his turn to vote, he had to decide, do I go with what I know my senses are telling me or do I go with the crowd? One third of those tested caved into group pressure and changed their vote to agree with their peers. So we need to understand that group pressure is not a little thing. Group pressure is a big thing. You know, for young kids, having sex before marriage is a normal thing. So you need to decide for, you know, not coming to church, not living your life for Jesus is a normal thing. Not, you know, giving your course of the gospel is a normal thing. Putting your family ahead of God is a normal thing. Now, I'm the first one to say God first, then the family, then the church. But you've got to put your God, your God comes ahead of your family. Can I hear you say amen? amen. You need to understand that. And, and because if you live it God's way, it always works out in God's way. You've got to love and respect your families, obviously. You've got to respect your workplace, obviously. You've got to respect those around you, obviously. But don't do it and disrespect your God. And that's the difference that you need to understand because God is a jealous God and He does come second. He comes? You're not really convinced, man. I I've got a big job. He comes? Uh, oh, look, my heart is beating a little bit happier. God comes first. In Matthew chapter 19, 6 to 22, I'm just going to touch really briefly on this one. It says this, Now a man came up to Jesus and he said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? This is a story of the rich, young ruler. He says, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which one? The man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false ten- testimony, honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. The young guy's thinking, he's going, bingo, I won. No, he goes this, all these I've kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Why? Because he was religious. And he did all the good things that the religious thing says to do. So he came to church and he was nice to everybody and he did everything. But there was something missing on the inside. There's something missing on the inside. Because he was Mr. Religion. And the religious people put Jesus on the cross. Right, Mr. Religion put Jesus on the cross. So he says, what am I still missing? Because it's not working. I'm good, I'm reading my Bible, I'm doing the church, I'm helping, I'm not hurting anyone. What am I still missing? At least he had the brains in his head to say, what am I still missing? Why isn't everything really good? Because there's something missing. All these I've kept, verse 20, the young man said. What do I still lack? Verse 21, Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Verse 22, When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. He had a lot to lose. Why? Because Jesus has got the ability to go right into your jugular. Because he wants you. I would that you were either hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, the Bible says, I will not like you very much. (laughs) No, he still loves you, but it's not going to work. The formula doesn't work. 
It's like baking a cake. My wife cooks these amazing cakes. If I try, it doesn't work. I get the same whatever, and it doesn't work. I try, it doesn't work. You've got to do the right formula, the balance. You've got to do everything right. So what was his mistakes? Number one, he didn't recognize Jesus as Lord. The young ruler came rushing to Jesus and falling on his knees and asked, Good teacher, what good thing need I to do? But Jesus, he gave him disarming questions. The young man did not recognize with whom he was talking. He was talking to Jesus. I said before, is he Lord, liar or lunatic? So the first thing is he didn't recognize Jesus as Lord. It was another system. Second mistake was that he was unaware of his own faults. We need to understand that no one is better than anybody else. And you don't need to understand it here. You need to understand it here. Don't look at other people and think, oh, you know, I'm okay compared to him. Because if you don't, my teaching's meant zero. I hope you walk out of here hoping, I pray with all my heart, you walk out of here knowing if it wasn't for the grace of God, I am rubbish. doesn't matter if you're brought up in church or not brought up in church, if your past was drug dealing or not, nobody is good without Jesus. We all miss the mark. And you need to get that in your heart, in your head, especially people from good families, so to speak, that the world looks is so wonderful and I'm okay because you're not okay. You're not right. You're the same as everybody else. It's religious hypocrisy that we live in families that think, oh, we're good people. We're not good people. In the world's eyes, you might be, but in God's eyes, we need the blood of Jesus regardless. Can I hear you say amen? Because if you haven't understood that, it doesn't work. The formula doesn't work because we think, oh, I'm not as bad as, as this guy because he's worse than me. It doesn't work. It doesn't work without... So you need to understand, the rich man was unaware of his own faults. What? That he was greedy. That he had money and he wasn't going to share it with anybody. That he, was, he would give what he had to do, but he wasn't going to give more because that was his little God. He had a little uh, temple thing and there was money there and he goes, oh, what do you bow down to? Is it a TV show? Is it a sport? Is it a job? Is it a career? Is it your family? Is it your status? What is it that we will be untouchable that Jesus is no-go zone? Because if you've got a no-go zone, Jesus gets very offended because he wants to get in there. He wants the surgery. He wants to, you know, God wants to get a hold of you. He wants to change your life, but he wants to get a hold of you. He wants to get that stuff and he wants to hold you and say, I love you with all my heart and I want to change you. But he's got to get a hold of you. Thirdly, he, he misunderstood the plan of grace. He said, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? There is no one thing you've got to do. you just got to believe in Jesus Christ. You can't do anything to get the blood of Jesus on you. You can't earn it. You can't be good. Because if you try and be good, you're a religious person. Christianity is God coming to you. Religion is you coming to God. Religion is you trying to, by your good works, justifying yourself, and it doesn't work. That is the mystery of the grace of God. Finally, the fourth mistake was that he went away. He didn't have the guts. He didn't have the internal force. To, he didn't have the insight where he said, sadly, he walked away. So, now, I don't know his long term, what happened to him, but Jesus confronted him. Jesus, got a, Jesus wants you and he wants your heart. He's not interested in you. He's not interested in your money. He's not interested in your status. He loves you. It's all about serving him and worshipping him. Because how do you stop people from uh, doing naughty things, from gossiping? You get more of Jesus into them. How do you stop people from hurting? You get more of Jesus into them. Let me tell you something. If you, it's, if you try and just fight this thing, sometimes it's bigger than you. You've just got to do more good stuff. You've got to get more. It's like the glass is half empty, half full. If I want to get, you know, if, if the water is bad or whatever, anyway, you guys know where I'm going with this. You've just got to fill it up. You know, I don't take the air out. If I want to get more water in there, I don't go, how the heck am I going to get the air out of here? I just put in more water. I don't play with my mind and say, do I need a vacuum machine to get the water, to get the air out of here? And then I put in the water. It doesn't work like that. 
You know, scientifically, how can I get the air out of here? Well, I'm not smart. Well, I'll fill it up with something else. The thing is, what do you fill up your mind with? If you try and say, man, if air is sin, and I'm going, oh, how am I going to get the sin out? How am I going to get the sin out? How am I going to sin out? How am I going to get the sin out? How am I going to get the air out of the thing? How am I going to stop? How am I going to stop air coming into here? You just put it in with more water. Pretty simple, isn't it? And it's the same with Christianity. you just got to put in more of God in your life. And as you put in more of God in your life, His blessing will be there for you and your life will change in Jesus' wonderful name. So be transformed. So He went away. He went away. Finally... Finally, we need to be transformed into the image of Jesus. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Change the way that you think. Your greatest battle is between your ears, in your brain. You've got a big brain, trust me. It is, you know, Einstein said you only use about 10% of it. Younger people, I hope you use more than 10%. Sometimes I would argue with that. But you only use about 10% of your brain. It is full of stuff that you can do. And so we need to use and do uh, John, oh, all sorts of verses here. I just want to go through. In Romans 8.29 says this, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. In Romans 8.29. God's desire is that we be transformed into the image of Jesus. How do we know that we're becoming more like Jesus? Galatians 5.22 says this, but this is the fruit of the Spirit. This is the fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I'll read them again. Why don't you repeat them? Love. Oh man, come on. Love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what we need. We need that. That's, that's like the God test that we need to... That's what we need to do. So how do we do it? We renew our minds. If I could have the musos come up, we're just, uh, just going to... I've got to pray today for someone. Who is it? Laura asked for some prayer. So perhaps if someone could get Laura, we're going to pray for her today. If someone could get her, perhaps. We've got to renew our minds. In John 8, 31, it says this, If you abide in my word, and you are my, you are my disciples indeed. So what do we need to do? We need to abide in the word of God. We need to live in the word of God. We need to let it change our thinking. We need to let it change our understanding. And the other thing is we need to be people of prayer. In John chapter 15, 4 to 5, it says these words, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So I want to encourage you today, in Jesus' name, to make a decision. That's not hard. Make a decision. Make a decision to follow Jesus. Do I want you to make a decision to follow Jesus? Of course I do. I'm the pastor. (laughs) Of course I do. Do I want you to change your life? Absolutely, of course I do. But can I make you change your life? If God doesn't do it, how can I do it? If God doesn't make you, how can I make you? You come, you come of your own decision-making process. You don't come because of music or this or that. You don't even have to come now. You make a decision in your heart and you say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I need you. I want to worship you. I want to praise you. I want it to be real. That's all you've got to say. That's all you've got to say. That's all you've got to do. And then if you do that, you allow God to come in. Will you be perfect from that time on? The answer is no. 
I wish it was. I wish it was the magic pill. And then you no, but it's up here that the big victory has got to be won. It's up here that it starts. And then you become more than powerful in Jesus' name. Now, I know that the Lord, I feel in my heart the Lord's touched hearts today. And so it's your opportunity to respond or to not respond. I am just the guy that, you know, hopefully listens and allows the Holy Spirit to speak what he says. Some guy's got a really good track record. You look at someone like Noah, he preached 120 years and no one responded. Problem is that all those people weren't very good at treading water and so it wasn't good for them. I don't know, how long can you tread water? How long can you tread water? And so, we're going to sing this song just once. I'm going to pray for Laura because I was asked to pray and we're going to believe that God's going to do something great. If anybody else wants to come, you come. If you guys want to see me during the week, I'm more than happy and willing to. Last week I met with someone during the week. Uh, he gave his life to Jesus. And that was wonderful. So, Laura, if you can come out, let's all be upstanding. Let's worship the Lord. If you feel in your heart you want to respond, you come. And we're just going to worship the Lord. Hallelujah.